Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Between the Hashes, our weekly college football primer. Coming to you from Los Angeles, California, I'm your host, Matt Kime. And today, even though we actually have four ranked matchups we can talk about and will talk about that today, it's actually kind of a uh, calm before the storm week. What do I mean by that? I mean, next week we have, at, at the very least, if nothing else, a top five matchup, and pre presuming that the teams that should win do win this week at least one top five and potentially a second top ten matchup coming this week. We have last rivalry games while the Pac-12 conference and Big 12 conferences are still intact the way they are. We have... We'll talk about that next week. Um, for this week, we have a lot... At least three of the top four aren't playing ranked teams. Um, the, ex the exception being Georgia and, to be honest... The team they're playing is severely overranked, and you also have teams like Alabama playing their November cupcake before their rivalry games. And so, outside of that, there are a few notable games to get into. But before we get into that, remember to give us a like, comment, subscribe. If you like what you've been seeing all season, remember to subscribe to Empire Media. If you like college football, if you like the Washington Commanders and Washington sports in general, subscribe to Empire Media on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts. Now, before we get into the games, there is actually a little bit more of an update on the Michigan scandal. You'd think based on the way that Michigan was acting that Harbaugh was not part of this earth anymore. That is not the case. He has just been suspended for three games. Going into the Penn State game, there was talk about potentially getting a temporary restraining order, and they had a judge on call ready to receive any kind of injunctions. That it didn't. That ended up falling through, and after a week of deliberating, Michigan actually earlier today. I'm filming this on Thursday of this week. Announced that they will accept whatever penalty they will accept the three game suspension, meaning that Harbaugh will not be on the sideline tomorrow against Maryland and will not be on the sideline next week against Ohio State. The NCAA is still doing its investigation, and I'm sure the Big Ten is still doing its digging. A lot of this was because there was a l significant amounts of pressure put on the Big Ten to take action while the season was rolling on. They didn't want the season to continue unimpeded for Michigan because the benefits were coming this season for them. That's the latest update on the Michigan scandal, and like I normally do, I will give updates as I get them. That is just the current status of the scandal. More on that later, I am sure of it. So the next biggest thing is uh, just reactions to the last week of games. Utah once again proved that it is punching well above its weight class in hanging around in a in a thrilling game up in Seattle, 35-28 Michigan, or 35-28 Washington win, but Utah was hitting big plays with Bryson Barnes. He got knocked out of the game at one point, came back, toughed it out. It, it just wasn't quite enough at the end of the day. Meanwhile, uh, the one of the other significant ranked matchups that happened, one of the games I talked about, Georgia steamrolled Ole Miss and reclaimed their top overall spot in the CFP rankings. And to be honest, I have had them number one in my personal rankings pretty much the entire year that I've been doing them. I don't really have too many arguments here. And in fact, here's the committee's top 10. Georgia, Ohio State, Michigan, Florida State, Washington, Oregon, Texas, Alabama. Those top eight I have pretty much been static the entire time so far with the exception of Ohio State and Georgia flipping. The next two are the notable parts, Missouri at nine, Louisville at 10, with Oregon State bringing up the rear at 11. The reason why I highlight Oregon State being at 11 is that I actually have uh, Missouri. I think Missouri is slightly overranked. I don't think Louisville should be that low. I know they had a scare against Virginia, and they do have a very baffling loss. But at the end of the day, they're the one other remaining Power 5 team with one or fewer losses. And if you don't think Louisville's for real, fair enough, we'll see that play out because it's very likely that them and Florida State will be meeting in the ACC title game. Me personally, I have Oregon State in the top 10. I've had them in my top 10 for a few weeks. Here's my top 10. The reason why I'm going Oregon State over Missouri is Oregon State's just a more complete team. They have better wins for the most part. You, you, you can make arguments about like the merits of beating Kansas State versus Utah, but I think a lot, once again, I think Missouri is being propped up based on two things. One, that their first loss was to LSU, who I still think is, like Missouri's most impressive performances all, for the most part, have all come in losses. 
And so I do, like I don't want to poke too too many holes in Missouri, but if I'm going to split hairs between two teams, I think Oregon State is the more complete of the two teams. That said, if I were to extend my top 10 into a top 15, Missouri would be 11. So it's really not that. It's really, really close. I just personally think Oregon State's, if the two played right now, Oregon State would win. But we're kind of at a point where this stuff will figure itself out. Oregon State, for example, has a murderer's row in its next two weeks with uh, Washington. And if they get through this week against Washington, that's the headliner game, oh, by the way. If they get through this head, if they get through this game, their reward is playing Oregon next week. So <laughs> more on them in a minute. But like, honestly, if Oregon State can come out of the schedule that they've had this year with only two losses, I certainly think that makes them one of the best 10, if not one of the best five teams in the country. And that is not to discredit the job that Coach Drinkowitz and everybody is doing in Columbia, Missouri. Like I said, I think Missouri has proved that they're a legit team. They're just not at the elite tier, at least not now. But they went into Athens and they did a hell of a lot better than Ole Miss did. Speaking of Georgia, lightning round time. So once again, I'm gonna be looking at a Georgia game. This time, Georgia goes to Knoxville, Tennessee to play the Volunteers. Georgia is currently favored by 10 and a half points as of the time of this recording. To be honest, I'm surprised that the line is even this small. Tennessee does do a few things well, especially on the line of scrimmage, and that was somewhere where Georgia struggled, at least to begin the year. It seems like they've ironed out a lot of their issues. Georgia seems to be peaking at the right time, and Tennessee is coming off of a four touchdown loss to Missouri. And I gotta be honest, I don't really see how Tennessee keeps this close. They're not playing the Georgia team from two months ago. They're playing a Georgia team that, they're playing a Georgia team that just got Brock Bowers back. They're playing a Georgia team coming off of a huge, huge win. And I think Georgia wins and I think Georgia covers. Number two, let's go to the Pac-12, Utah and Arizona. Oh man, these two teams are, if you're, if we're talking about teams that have punched well above their weight class, I think Arizona and Utah are both in the conversation for that. In one case, one is completely decimated by injuries, went and then went in with a third string quarterback and then outgunned Caleb Williams and nearly upset Washington. And the other has honestly, has one of the more baffling losses of the season, the farther and farther away we get from it, with Arizona's loss to Mississippi State very, very early in the season. Arizona is one of the more remarkable turnarounds this year. I don't think anybody was expecting them to be this good. They're coming off of four or five years of just absolutely terrible football, uh, bad coaching hires, recruiting is in the toilet, yet they both are kind of overcame a lot to get to the records that they're at. And so from a narrative standpoint, this game is a lot of fun. And two aggressive defenses, two offenses that seem to show up when they are absolutely needed to show up the most. I'm going to give the nod to Arizona. This is just a one point spread, coin flip of a game. The reason why I'm going Arizona is that, is that the Wildcats are playing at home and Utah's on the road. I, uh, this is going to be a fun matchup, and to be honest, both of these teams, if they keep, if they finish out the season as strongly as they've started it, they're going to go into next year as favorites in the Big 12 that they're about to join. Just to reiterate, Arizona wins, they cover, and uh, I could, <laughs> this is one of those games where I know after making this pick I'm going to be wrong, but for the sake of integrity, I'm going to stick with it. Arizona wins. Speaking of the Big 12, let's go there. Our next ranked matchup is 25 Kansas hosting 21 Kansas State. When is the last time that this game, Farmageddon as it's so affectionately called, has been a ranked matchup? Off the top of my head, I couldn't tell you. I will put it in the, I will find the answer and I will put it in the comments here below. Lance Leipold, what he has done at Kansas in the span of only a few years is nothing short of amazing. However, the problem for Kansas last year was twofold. One, its defense, and two, injuries to its quarterbacks. And both of those issues are rearing their heads once more this year. The line is nine and a half in favor of Kansas State. I like the Wildcats to go to Lawrence, Kansas and win and cover just because I don't trust the health of Kansas right now. So Kansas State wins, they cover. Next one, Louis, top 10 Louisville. Goes on the road to Miami as underdogs. Miami is currently favored by one, and Louisville is coming off of a scare against Virginia where they had to come from behind to win. 
Meanwhile, Miami's coming off of a heartbreaking loss to Florida State, where even though it was one score, it was kind of clear that Florida State was never really in danger of losing that game. It, honestly, Miami started the season strong, and they seem to have been regressing each and every single week since about the midpoint of October. And I don't, even though they're favored, I don't trust their quarterback play to be consistent enough to keep up with Louisville's attack. And therefore, I like Louisville to win and cover. And that does it for the lightning round. And let's get to our headliner game of the week. We go to Corvallis, Oregon to watch the Washington Huskies go on the road and play the Oregon State Beavers. And you know how I just highlighted how Louisville was in Despite being the higher ranked team, they are the road underdog. Well, it is the same case here. Washington State is on the road and Oregon State is slightly favored. So without getting too much into gambler's fallacy, let's, let's take a look at that. Oregon State has lost at home once in the last three years. And in that span, they are 10 in one against the spread. So probably one of the more underrated home field advantages in the entire sport. Adding on to this, there's an extra level of attention on these games, especially for Oregon State, and here's why. So I haven't spoken about conference realignment too, too much in this video series. I have decided to continue this segment into the off season, so I will get a chance to kind of uh, debrief and preview what happened and what's coming. But to make a long story short, to be going into the 2022 season, you, you had the LA schools announced that they were going to be bolting for the Big Ten going into 2024, going in, in the weeks upcoming to this season, a number of schools all jumped ship from the Pac-12. Colorado, Utah, and the Arizona schools going to the Big 12, and Oregon and Washington going to the Big Ten. Cal and Stanford, strangely enough, are currently in talks with the ACC. I believe that deal is going through, meaning that Washington State and Oregon State are getting left on an island all alone. As to what's happening to the Pac-12, who gets decision-making in the Pac-12, what happens to the revenue, has all been the subject of a series of legal battles that, that Oregon State and Washington State seem to actually be on the winning side of. But the point is, is that Washington State and Oregon State are having happen what happened to like Houston back in the 90s when the Southwest and the Big Eight broke up, it's happening to them. They're getting kicked out of the Power Five, and the most likely outcome here is that there's going to be some sort of merger with the Big with uh, the Mountain West Conference. And even though it's going to be a good G5 conference, and even though that the playoffs will be a hell of a lot more inclusive with uh, the upcoming 12 team expansion, they're getting left for dead. Basically, there's a lot happening off the field that is informing some of the emotions on the field in these games, and this is no exception. And so this is kind of like Oregon State's last hurrah in the Pac-12. This is their last moment to ruin somebody else's season. This is their last moment to kind of go over the top. Meanwhile, on the other sideline, this is Washington's, I think, first 10-0 start since they actually won the national title in the early 90s. So what they're doing, they have, they, even though Washington is like historically a, a decent to solid program, they especially for the last 30 years, with the exception of like Chris Peterson's tenure there, haven't really been all that much. Enter Kalen DeBoer, enter, enter Michael Penix, who it probably is the favorite to win the Heisman right now. I don't have the odds in front of me, but I believe he's the favorite. They have one of the best receiving cores in the country. They have one of the fastest. They have one of the most athletic and best playmakers at quarterback. The guy barely turns the ball over. And the scary thing with Washington is that some of their receivers, McMillan, for example, he's been hurt for the, like half the season. So it's it's kind of like an Ohio State from last year conundrum, maybe not necessarily to that degree, but they have been playing hurt and they're only going to get healthier as the season goes on. And it's, I think McMillan is supposed to play and so one of the one of the big key matchups to watch is um, Washington State Washington's passing attack versus Oregon's secondary. Who wins that matchup? Well, Oregon State has a substantially better overall rated defense than than Washington. There's something like 60 spots higher. Washington's in the 90s in terms of overall defense. Oregon State's in the 30s. They strangely only give up about one less yard per play. Part of the reason for that is that if you do a little bit of digging into Washington's defensive numbers, part of it is that um, in obvious passing down situations like second and long, third and long, stuff like that, Washington's defense 
their numbers actually substantially go up, not to the degree that you would want it to. I'm not gonna say that this is a great defense or anything, but their troubles come in the early passing down situations on standard down. So like first and 10, second and five, third and three, stuff like that. And so that's when their defensive numbers go really, really bad. Now, the problem is, is that I don't wanna to make too, too many excuses for Washington's passing defense because Bryson Barnes, and, and I absolutely no disrespect to Utah, what Coach Whittingham is doing there, what Bryson Barnes has accomplished this season, that said, there was a reason why going into that game, the only time Bryson Barnes looked like that was against USC's Swiss cheese of a defense. I live in LA, I have to get a weekly shot at USC. I, get, I, I gotta do it. And so I don't think that bodes well because DJ Oyagole is a much, much, much better quarterback than Bryson Barnes. He has thrown 20 interceptions, or he has thrown 20 touchdowns to four interceptions. And despite the fact that he's not going to be seen as like a first round pick or anything, he has very, very much rehabilitated his image after the disaster that happened at Clemson. And I think it's safe to say, especially with Clemson's struggles this season, that a lot of what went wrong, despite the fact that he may not have been the solution, he certainly wasn't the problem there. Meanwhile, Oregon State also has a nasty rushing attack. And so Oregon State's key to victory here is to just run the ball and tr control the clock. Kind of a la Stanford against Oregon way back in the day when David Shaw and Jim Harbaugh were doing their things there. So basically, whoever can dictate the style of the game is going to win the game. Oregon State can stay ahead of schedule on offense and play ball control and keep the game a little bit low scoring, limit the number of possessions that the game has. Oregon State will win. If Washington can get their offense up and running, gets momentum, and avoids a repeat of what happened last week against Utah, Washington wins. Now, what do I think is the most likely outcome here? So, and before I make my pick, here's one more, here's one more meta narrative going into this. Washington State has a better strength of schedule and a better strength of record than Florida State. They have better wins, they have better players, and to be honest, and this is no shot at Jordan Travis or anything, they have the better quarterback, and you know, if Jordan Travis is the worst of two quarterbacks in a comparison, you're doing pretty well there. But to be honest, it kind of feels like the committee and the AP poll sometimes go with name recognition over what we're all seeing. And, and it's not necessarily Florida State's fault that its resume is just gets weaker by the week. It gets weaker with every LSU and every Clemson loss. But at the same time, they don't have a win nearly as good as Oregon. And to be honest, I'm gonna take, I, I would take Utah in a matchup over Clemson. Like, so they have two of the three, so Washington has two of the three best wins over them. They have the more consistent passing attack. Um, they have the worst defense, but to be honest, I think just resume alone, if the committee was gonna put Ohio State at one and they were right to do that for the weeks that they did that, you also have to turn around and recognize that Washington has the better resume. And so Washington is still kind of fighting for respect here. So I think there's a reason why Oregon State has lost just once in the past three years there. And I think that, I don't think that loss will be joined by another this week. So what I'm going to say is that Oregon State will narrowly win this game. Oregon State will dictate the game and win a shocking upset and reduce the amount of undefeated teams this season. Oregon State wins, they cover. And that's all I have for you guys this week. Thanks for sticking to the end. Remember to like, comment, and subscribe if you like what you see here or if you are a fan of the John Kime Report for updates on the Washington Commanders. Is Sam Howell the guy? I personally think so, but that's nobody asked me. So remember to like, comment, subscribe, and enjoy the games, and we'll see you next week.